Andre Kertej, a life in photographs. Uh, let's talk about the self-portraits. That'll help us get into the New York story a little bit. Um, so I mentioned at the start that uh, he did approximately 1,200 self-portraits during his lifetime. That's uh, quite an obsession. Um, this is one that he took in the early 1920s. So this is after he returned home from the First World War, uh, was struggling to figure out what sort of job he could have as an adult. Um, you know, tried a number of different jobs, many that were sourced by his family that were worried about, you know, Kertes, uh, you know, being able to support himself. And um, this is him as a beekeeper. So it's one of the many occupations that he tried. And with each one of them, he would also do a self-portrait in the guise of whatever job he was doing. So this is Kertes as a beekeeper. There's photographs of him as a school teacher, as a business person. There's photographs of him in drag, um, but constantly acting for the camera and I think trying to see quite literally what suited him for the future. He would also use self-portraits uh, to send back home. So this is soon after arriving in Paris. He would take pictures of himself uh, trying to show himself looking happy and successful, uh, sending them back to his family. And, you know, when pictures like this would arrive home, his mother would respond by saying that, oh, he should come home immediately because he looks emaciated and needs to eat and should be back home with his family. Hard to fool your family. We talked about those two pictures already. And then here he is at uh, their famous apartment at 2 Fifth Avenue, uh, which overlooked Washington Square. This is in uh, the early 1970s. Looks like he's preparing for a trip or something, uh, wanting to capture himself. Love the way he used the, uh, the mirror here. And this is the same room uh, in 1984, so uh, yeah, about a year before he passed away. Um, and he looks like he's fading into the background. This is him as the successful photographer in Paris, a shadow portrait, sort of as the master of shadows and light. I think he summed it up in this photograph. But as I was saying, so things started to go slightly awry in Paris. Um, he was offered a one-year contract with Keystone Photo Agency in New York City. And uh, with Elizabeth's encouragement, because she didn't like Paris as much as Andre, there was also the specter of Rosa Klein, the first wife that was in this larger circle of people that Andre uh, hung out with. And... Um, she was happy to take up, you know, to have Andre take up this job. And um, she saw it as something exciting going into the new world. And, you know, he thought he could make a big name for himself again. Um, but this was the reality that he faced. So this was photographed in 1937, uh, months after they arrived in New York. It ended up that the Keystone Photo Agency you know, really was going somewhat bankrupt and they thought that by having Andre come to the new world that perhaps this great European photographer could save the company. Um, you know, they didn't have the jobs that they had promised. They didn't have the money that they had promised. It ended up that there was a lawsuit, uh, the Andre suing the owners. Um, but he continued to wander the streets and, you know, tried to take photographs uh, tried to do other type of jobs, like gave us, you know, tried to do fashion photography, product photography, like anything he could. But he felt that this was him in New York. It's called the Lost Cloud. And Andre felt that he was this cloud that was this beautiful thing that, you know, was high and observant and um, carefree and yet you know, this was the harsh reality of this metropolis that he found himself in, the brutal city of New York. 
This was taken in the same year, um, you know, ventilator arm. So it's, you know, quite simply a repairman inside a ventilator shaft fixing something. But, you know, another way to look at it is this horrific uh, accident about to happen that it looks like this man's right arm is about to get sliced off. And that is very much how Andre felt that, um, so now we can talk about the melancholic tulip. So in 1939, the war had broken out. Um, he couldn't go back home, even if he wanted to, because of the war. Uh, Elizabeth didn't want to leave. That She and someone else that also worked with Helena Rubinstein were in New York, and they set up their own company making knockoffs of French perfumes. And especially when the war broke out, that they were doing quite well selling to all of the department stores in the New York area and beyond. And Andre had been locked out of his studio because he couldn't afford the rent, he couldn't find any jobs. Um, so he took this photograph, which he described himself as being the melancholic tulip. So similar to the tulip that we're looking at, that he had been cut off in, it, in his prime and left isolated to die. To drive that point home, this was the image that he sent out as a Christmas card to the few friends that he had in 1939. Andre, your melancholic tulip. <laughs> 